Hello everyone. Uh, I welcome you to this class. I wish to take this opportunity uh, to thank you all for coming to this class and for joining this university. And uh, by way of an introduction, my name is Sosin Ngabirano and I'll be taking you through the Law of Contract 1 class. So on that note, once again, let me welcome you all to this class. And uh, by way of housekeeping rules, I want to rem remind you that we are living in unprecedented times of COVID-19, so we need to keep ourselves safe. Please always put on your mask whenever you are in a public place or if you're talking to someone in close proximity and always sanitize your hands. Don't ask me when I'm, why I'm not putting on one because as you can see, I'm within the safety of my compound while recording this video, so I'm not in a public place. So please remember, we need to avoid to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and make sure that we keep safe. Okay, and uh, like I said, I'll be taking you through the law of contract. Uh, for this is a course for LLB one, but can also be attended by other students doing other related courses. Uh, I know you've had an opportunity to meet my colleague. Uh, who has taken you through an introduction. So I will not repeat that, but I'll go straight forward to our topic of the day, which is contract formation or formation of a contract. Now, before we start, I want to give you a live example of how a contract is formed. And I want you to take it that law of contract is something simple. It's not hard. We've all interfaced with the law of contract and we've, in one way or the other, had an opportunity to, you know, practice this law of contract, probably unknowingly or knowingly. One, I can show you that today I'm putting on this watch. But if I tell you the process which I went through to get this watch, then you would know that law of contract is such a simple subject. Like I'm going to illustrate. So I woke up and I'm an ardent love of watches. So I wanted to buy a watch. And I moved from uh, my place. I went to a shop that sells watches. Where I found these watches displayed. And this watch was uh, had a display price of 300,000 shillings. Ugandan shillings. So I had to engage the shopkeeper you know with the view of having a reduction in that particular price okay and we later agreed that the, sh that the, that the watch would be given to me at a price of 270,000 shillings what does that mean so when i found this watch in the shop window in law with that price displayed we say that that was an invitation to treat and the moment i negotiated and gave an offer of uh, 270,000 shillings, that becomes an offer. That offer may or may not be accepted. But the moment it is accepted, then you have to look at the concept of consideration. What is the consideration for this watch? Now, when we look at the consideration, then it means that there must be an exchange of promises. One, I have a watch, rather I have money, and the shopkeeper has a watch so the shopkeeper will exchange i'll give him the money in exchange for the watch there is that exchange you will see the case of curie versus misa later on when you are looking at the principle of consideration in greater details and it will give you you know the nitty gritties of what i mean when i talk about consideration now after consideration then you have to confirm that you know the parties that are trying to contract have the intention to create legal relations parties must have intended to create legal relations before you enter into a contract and then finally the parties that are contracting must have the capacity to contract under the ugandan constitution the capacity the age of capacity or the legal age is 18 years but please note that in some cases the age of capacity uh, to contract may be reduced 
in uh, depending on the nature of the contract say for example in uh, a contract between miners which contract deals with uh, items that we call necessities so in brief that's an overview of a contract that has been formed so if i conform or i have all those elements in place i will say that we have a valid contract to purchase this watch and as i can i know that all of you have in one way or the other engaged in this kind of transactions you purchased one thing or the other so in purchasing that item you've actually undergone a process of contracting all through that process you're in a process of contracting and you've met the elements of a valid contract okay excuse me so you've made the elements of a valid contract and those are the elements that we shall consider through the course of this semester uh, i will welcome questions i know questions will come in uh, and by the way of uh, by the way we have uh, our interactive classes every we have our interactive classes every friday and saturday uh, i will be taking on the saturday classes and my colleague will be meeting you on friday so please reserve any questions that you might have and you can always communicate those questions to us and we engage either on our official emails which i believe you have or personally you can send me a text on my uh, phone which is uh, 0782 000 404 now i want us to move into i've talked about all that uh, transaction uh, when i was buying my watch that i just showed you here which took us through a number of things but what you need to note is that before the watch was bought there must be an agreement in law, we always talk about something to do with consensus ad idem, or what is uh, summarized as meeting of minds. Consensus ad idem, uh, some referred as the meeting of the minds. So before you enter into any transaction, there must be a meeting of the minds, which is an agreement. And traditionally, an agreement requires two particular uh, elements. One is the element that there must be a valid offer and secondly the fact that that offer must be accepted by the other party that's a traditional way that we look at an agreement and that agreement for it to be in existence those two particular elements must be proved uh, but as you can see from the slides that i'm presenting sometimes courts have held that there are cases where you don't need to prove um, you know the two elements for there to be a contract like in that case of Trentham limited versus act crucial last far where court stated that uh, uh, the strict analysis of an offer and acceptance eh, was not necessary in executed contracts in a commercial settings please note that in some cases you may not have the two elements specified or identifiable but in normal cases for you to talk about an agreement there must be an offer and there must be acceptance thank you now uh, before we proceed there is need and you will get to know the reason why i'm talking about this to distinguish between a unilateral and a bilateral agreement now uh, a unilateral agreement consists of an exchange of promises for example i will sell you my phone for 300000 shillings or uh, and the acceptance will be i will give you 300000 shillings for your phone now in a unilateral rather that's a bilateral kind of agreement but in a unilateral agreement the offerer alone makes a promise so there is no reciprocal promise by the offeree now in that kind of unilateral agreement uh, the offer is accepted by doing what is set out in the offer for example let me say i lost my phone and i want to put a price for someone who can find that phone so i will say you know and my offer will be 
I will pay 300,000 to anyone who turns who returns my phone and the acceptance in those terms would be the lost phone is returned so here is your phone and I need my 300,000 you realize that on the part of the person returning the phone there is no equivocal promise okay they are just performing please note that the distinction is important with regard to various things and these include uh, where people make advertisements you've seen adverts in newspapers we are going to look at them uh, two that distinction is also important when we are looking at revocation of offers and then it's equally important in communication of acceptance as we shall see when you are looking at uh, uh, communication of acceptance so please bear that uh, those three important points at the back of your mind so that they can help you when you are looking at the other parts of the uh, of the course under this offer so uh, thank you let me take you now to the to the elements of the contract the ones i talked about at the beginning and i want us to start with the element of offer what is an offer in the first place so an offer has been defined as a definite promise to be bound provided that certain special terms are accepted and this definition can be found under section 2a of the contract act uh, please note that for there to be an offer that it must be clear definite and certain but there are particular elements or terms that might be fulfilled for us to talk about a valid offer and these include the following one an offer must be communicated so that the offeree may accept or reject it because you cannot talk about acceptance when there is no communication of an offer please also note that the offer may be communicated in writing you know when you write down some note it may be oral by speaking or it may be it may be oral uh, or it may be by some sort of conduct whereby you act and the conduct becomes very important when we are looking at uh, acceptance of unilateral offers remember what i talked about when i was distinguishing them that a unilateral offer is accepted by conduct you perform the terms of that offer and we are going to look at them in greater details uh, during the course of this uh, this uh, lecture then secondly or thirdly rather an offer may be made to a particular person one person or it may be made to a group of persons or it may be made to the whole world now the question i would pose to you is it possible to make an offer to the whole world do you think it is practical in your understanding i don't know but one in the case of Khalil versus Kabolic smoke ball uh, which can help you you know illustrate this particular point the defendants in that matter issued uh, an advertisement in their uh, the, in, in which they offered to pay a hundred pounds to any person who used their smoke ball and then succumb to influenza this lady mr khalil saw the advert and used a smoke ball but then immediately the lady caught influenza she sued the company for british pounds 100 then the defendants which is the carbolic smoke ball company argued that it was not possible in english law to make an offer to the whole world would you agree that it's not possible to make an offer to the whole world of course court had a different opinion and in that case court held that an offer can be made to the whole world but that offer must be definite in substance and we shall look at this in greater details when you are looking at terms of the contract what do we mean when we talk about certainty of terms of a given contract okay 
So, in that case, it was established that an offer can be made to the whole world. Remember, in Khalil, the offer that was made was one of a unilateral nature whereby the person's acceptance was only by way of performing the conditions in the offer, and that was using the carbolic smoke ball. And something of the sort may happen right now. We are living in the pandemic of COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Probably a company may advertise that we have this vaccine. Anyone who doesn't use a mask and uses it will not contract COVID-19 and use the same mask. You use rather use the mask uh, following all the conditions, but at the same time, you contract the virus. What happens? The Khalil Kabbalic smoke bolt situation, I think, would be applicable. Lastly, uh, an offer must be distinguished from an invitation to treat. We've talked about adverts and all that. Now I want us to dwell into uh, the concept of an invitation to treat. What is an invitation to treat in law? Okay? Invitation to treat. What is it? When does it arise? Okay? You need to look at the different circumstances under which courts have said that these circumstances do not amount to an offer, but rather they amount to an invitation to treat. So, an invitation to treat has been defined as an indication that the inviter is willing to enter into negotiations, but he's not or she's not prepared to be bound immediately. You're not prepared to be bound immediately by your invitation. In the case of Gibson versus Manchester City Council in 1979, English case, the council wrote a letter which stated that we may be prepared to sell to you a house. You can add anything else that you want. But in that case, the House of Lords did not regard this as an offer, but a response to an invitation to treat. Uh, it wasn't an offer because it was merely an invitation to treat. Please note the words used. We may be prepared to sell to you. Okay? So a response to an invitation to treat does not lead to an agreement. The response may, however, be an offer by the person who is responding. That is... Uh, a sneak peek into what an invitation to treat looks like. So, please note that the distinction between an offer and an invitation to treat depends on the reasonable expectation of the parties. Parties are these two uh, people or two uh, persons who are contracting. It may be Sostin and one of you who is watching this video. We want to enter into a given contract. The court's have established that there is no intention to be bound in the following cases. And when we say there is no intention to be bound, then we mean that there is no contract. You haven't fulfilled the traditional view of a valid offer and an acceptance. And these instances are discussed below. One, there is an instance where goods are displayed for sale. The displays may take different formats one a display may be in a shop window and when a display is made in a shop or a shop window courts have interpreted it in different uh different ways let's start by looking at a display in a shop window and i want to refer you to a famous english case uh called the pharmaceutical society of great britain versus butch cast chemist a 1952 decision. Now, the court in this case held that in a self-service shop, take it to be like a supermarket, like game stores, the seller takes place, rather, sorry, excuse me, the sale takes place when the assistant accepts the customer's offer to buy the goods. So in that case, the display of the goods is a mere invitation to treat jokingly i've told people and it's true that i've gone to game stores 
and I negotiated on the price of a TV which was displayed in their shop window at 2.7 million and I bought it at 2.5 million. And because I was using my knowledge of love contract to negotiate and I told them, you've displayed 2.7 million but I have 2.5. So, the salesperson there told me that decision can be taken by only the manager. And I was referred to the manager of the game stores who gave me a voucher of 200000 Meaning that I could buy my television set at 2.5 million shillings. Okay? So, when you, saw, when you see things in the supermarket, please always endeavor to engage them. If you don't have enough money, try to negotiate those prices are not fixed at least in law now the other instance where you can talk about an invitation to treat is where you display sh things in a shop window my friends are girls ladies they love window shopping so when you go in a we when you're moving along the street and you see things displayed in a window shop what hap what comes to your mind is that an offer or is an invitation to treat in the case of Fisher versus Bell, it was held that a display of a flick knife in a shop window with a price attached was an invitation to treat. Okay? So, when you see things displayed, that's an invitation to treat. But there is a qualification to some of these displays. Where the display is by an automated tailor machine. Uh, say, these machines that sell uh, Yaka tokens or even air times. I've seen one uh, by a company called Payway. Payway. So when those machines display, because you have no opportunity to discuss with the machine, then that becomes an invite, rather an offer. Because the moment you insert money in the machine, then the transaction is complete. And there is a, a famous case by one of the famous lords. Lord Denning, it's called Thornton versus Shulen Parking. In that case, uh, Lord Denning held that vending machines and automatic automatic tailor or automatic ticket machines are making offers since once money is inserted, the transaction is irrevocable. Okay, we shall have a uh, you know a deeper discussion on this when you are looking at. Uh, issues of terms of a contract that is a topic on terms if i discuss it to you i will remind you uh, this particular concept if my colleague does i know she, he will also you know do the same then next you've seen advertisements in newspapers be it newspapers by government uh, calling people to bring in tenders they may be ngos non-government organizations private companies or private individuals those adverts are merely invitations to treat because if they were offers, then would open up a floodgate of litigation. Why? Because if I make an advertisement and call you, uh, it will be an offer to the entire world. And if you all accept, then I will be in breach of the contractual terms if I do not provide what I had advertised. Please look at the case of Petridge. Petridge versus Crittenden, 1968, which explains uh, the concept of advertisement. To continue with uh, invitations to treat, there is a concept of uh, when you advertise and your advert conforms to the uh, point of uh, being a unilateral offer. Now, things which are unilateral in nature, there is a problem always of limited stock. But when you make an offer which is unilateral, like what happened in uh, Kalir versus Kabolic Smoke Ball, then the advert in the newspaper will become an, an offer and not an invitation to treat. Please read that case and get to know the distinction between an invitation to treat and an offer. Because when you advertise to the whole world and the mode of acceptance is by way of performance, then whoever makes whoever performs the conditions that you put in the advert then that person will be accepting your offer and that's what exactly happened in Khalil versus Kabbalic smoke ball 
we shall revisit this decision when we are looking at the concept of acceptance so i would advise you please take out time read this authority and understand it very well now the other invitation to treat that i would want you to focus on is one you know auction sales when there is an auction as you will see in cases such as pine versus cave an auction is an invitation is an invitation to treat there is a lot of information regarding auctions uh, uh auctions being invitation to treat but what i want you to note is that when there has been an auction and uh the the auctioneer you know calls for people to make bids the moment the hammer falls you know i think you've seen those auctions in churches where they count uh ten thousand one time ten thousand the second time ten thousand the third time when the hammer is hit then the auction is closed then that the last uh, uh you know the last price becomes now the offer which is then accepted by the auctioneer and the transaction is concluded and the same approach or the same interpretation is applied to uh tenders tenders that you've seen in newspapers tenders uh calling for people to bid uh, by government by ngos by private entities but it's mainly by government and ngos and other private entities they are merely invitations to treat i hope you can take out time and read in deeper details there are cases uh which can explain this in greater details in a book by ewan mckendrick uh called um, uh contract law cases and materials and i think it's mentioned on your uh, reading list with all the you know details to help you access that particular book i hope you can read this and we can have a good discussion when we have our live uh classes okay there is uh, also something i wanted to note about something called subject to contract whenever you see this word placed on any letterhead it simply means that uh, someone is writing to you in order to indicate that an offer is known to be legally binding that offer when i write something to you and i say this is subject to contract it simply means that what i'm sending to you is not an offer that is binding it's something that i intend to be legally binding but it is subject to us entering into a contract okay now i want us to look at uh, termination of an offer now termination of an offer may be by revocation it may be by rejection or by lapse or operation of the law now when an offer is terminated by uh, re terminated by uh, revocation uh revocation means the termination is by the offerer so an offerer may withdraw an offer at any time before it has been accepted so the revocation must be communicated to the offeree before acceptance of course if you don't communicate the revocation then the offeree uh may accept so the concept of communication is very important in the case of Brian versus Van Tinhoven, a very old English case of 1880, the withdrawal of an offer sent by a telegram was held to be communicated only where the telegram was received. So communication need not to be made by uh, an offerer. Communication may also be through a third party, and that communication of a third party of revocation will suffice. In the case of Dixon versus Dodds the plaintiff was told by a neighbor that the property which had been offered to to him had been sold to a third party it was held that the offer had been validly revoked so an offer to keep an offer open for a certain length of time can be withdrawn like any other unless an option has been purchased for example consideration has been given to keep the offer open uh we should refer you to the authority of routledge versus grant uh, so uh with regard to a unilateral offer and revocation of the same it has been held that for you to revoke a unilateral offer you must remember unilateral offers are communicated via uh print media 
so you must communicate that offer in the same manner that rather you must communicate the revocation in the same manner that the offer was made so if you made your offer in the new vision newspaper then the revocation should equally appear in the new vision newspaper okay uh, uh, sorry i'm rushing through this i've been interrupted by the rain and i want to finish this recording but most of the information that i would wish to communicate to you about is displayed in this particular slide which is depicted below uh, this video so you will be able to read and get so I, and get the details so i may not be able to go through all that but on the revocation of the natural offer there is an authority of shue versus usa where it was held that communication will be assumed if or the offer takes reasonable steps to inform the public for example places an advert in the same newspaper so it's now established that the revocation cannot take place if the offeree has stated has started to perform the obligations under the offer and on that concept please look at the authority of errington versus errington then revocation of an offer can also be by lapse of time or operation of the law termination by operation of the law so an offer may lapse and thus may be incapable of being accepted because of passage of time so that at the end of the stipulated time if any then the offer lapses then an attempt to off to accept an offer to buy shares after five months failed as the offer had clearly lapsed in that case of uh, ramsgate versus ramsgate victoria hotel company versus montefiore that is a case which shows you that when an offer has lapsed because of passage of time then you cannot purport to accept it then the offer may also lapse because of death of the offeree if the offer was of a personal nature or death of the the offeree death of the offerer or death of the offeree then lastly an offer may lapse because of failure of a given condition then the offer may may lapse because of uh, a rejection an offer can be rejected uh, how can an offer be rejected if i stipulated certain terms and you come back to me with different terms all together then we call that a counter offer remember acceptance simply means that and simply means unqualified assent to the terms of an offer so if your acceptance comes with a different term altogether then we say that that is a counter offer and that offer cannot stand it will be rejected because rather it will be rejected by region by reason of the counter offer uh, that's uh, all about the rejection other things you can always read about the rejection and that can uh, how it can happen i've provided the slides and other materials on our e-learning platform then please note that a request for more information is not necessarily you know a rejection and does not lead to uh, a termination of uh, any an offer uh, so sorry for the last slides i've been really very fast i was caught up by the rain but that was it about an offer other materials shall be provided in the due course of the lecture and we have materials on our uh, platform please make sure that uh, you can uh, access them and also follow the reading guide which is available on the platform in our next class we shall look at acceptance as the next element of a valid contract please stay safe and keep time bye bye